Happy Sabbath again to all of you, our friends here in Canada, in the U.S., Philippines, and around the world. I thank God for this privilege of being with you again. Today, God has another beautiful message for you that will be delivered again by our speaker, Dr. Frias. I hope you'll be blessed with his message today. Before Dr. Frias speaks to us, let me read our foundation text to you. And it's found in, uh, first is found in John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the second one is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. May the Lord add blessing to this reading. Hi, happy Sabbath to all of you again. We are so happy and blessed that uh, we can be with you again this beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, I would like to greet all of you, our friends in Canada, in the U.S., and the Philippines, and all over the world. Thank God that we uh, he has given us this privilege again to share his wonderful message of saving the lost. We have a very interesting topic that uh, we'd like to uh, share with you today that God has inspired me to deliver to you. But before I do so, I would like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you so much that you have given us the opportunity again and this privilege of being able to share to our friends or are listening out there about your wonderful message of saving the lost. We have a very interesting topic their Father, and I hope that uh, this will reach all the people who would like to uh, be saved, who has a desire to be saved in your eternal kingdom and to be able to receive and achieve everlasting life. I pray, the Father, that you will grace us with your presence and please forgive us our sins so that we will be, we will deserve to be in your presence today and we'll be deserved to be able to uh, spread or to bring your message to these people who are listening out there all over the world. I ask all this favor in Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. So let me now go to the title or the topic that we are going to share with you this beautiful Sabbath day. Okay. It's a very interesting topic, and I hope that you will listen carefully to what God has inspired me to share with you today regarding on how he will be able to save us from eternal death. So the title could be how will Jesus save us from eternal death? It could be, how can Jesus save us from eternal death? Or it could be, how are we saved from eternal death? There are three ways on how Jesus will save us or saves us from eternal death. But before I do, before I discuss those three miracles of God's saving grace, I first would like to review with you what happened in the beginning and what is our the, the world condition today and why it is necessary to save us from this present condition of the world today. Some of these are repetition if you have uh, listened to my video last week you probably uh, are able to hear uh, the or hear some of these things that I'm going to review today because God started everything 
uh, correctly, perfectly. But how come that so many things went wrong? But today you'll get more information in addition to what you have heard last week. So let us, uh, Jesus said, according to what my wife has uh, read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through Jesus. That's what he said. So let's start from the beginning, the footprints of God. Everything that God did in the beginning was perfect. Perfect, there's nothing wrong with it. On the first day, he created a light, and then the second day, he divided the light, the light and the darkness, day and night. And the uh, third day, he uh, made the uh, land and the ocean and the grass to grow. And the fourth day, moon, stars. And the uh, uh, fifth day, he made the uh, pieces and uh, uh, the fowls that were flying in the air. And on the sixth day, uh, he made the animals on the ground. And also, he made the first humans, Adam and Eve, our first parents. But And on the seventh day, he, uh, he stopped his work, and he also created a holiday. And that holiday is the seventh day, is the Sabbath, which we call Saturday now. That is the holy day of the Lord. So he also created that as a day of remembrance uh, of creation. And he said that we should make this day holy. And this is what you call the Sabbath day because I have created it right from the beginning and pronounced it to be holy. So we cannot alter it with any other day because on the other, the first six days, he worked, but on the seventh day, he never worked. He made that day special. A sacred day, he called it, uh, he did three things on the uh, seventh day. He, he stopped his work, that means he never worked. The second thing is that it was he blessed the day and he made it holy. He never did that in the first six days. He worked on the six days. So that seventh day, and he said, this I show you, I teach, tell you that uh, this is what you have to do in order to remember me, in remembrance of me. Do it, do it while you are here on this earth. Do it for the rest of your life. Because even when I come, if I have to take some of you to heaven, uh, in the new heaven and the new earth, every seventh day, we are going to gather together to worship. All creatures that I have created will gather together to worship. And this is a day of fellowship for us. So. Nobody, he did not give any authority, he did not give any uh, instruction to anybody to change it to another day. So if somebody changed it to uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Sunday, you know that it was him who changed it, whoever that authority is, but it was not God himself. That's why if we believe God, if we believe the Bible, then we have to uh, obey what God said. Now, of course, uh, the devil has, uh, what did God say? He had an enemy because Adam and Eve, the first humans, they committed sin. And who did it? Who destroyed it? How come that nowadays things have changed? And uh, they and things thought, you know, when God said, according to the Bible, when God spoke, as he spoke, things existed. So the first, the original of everything uh, uh, was from God. It did not go through the process of uh, uh, what you call that, uh, another process that is uh, the, the process of Darwin, which is, uh, of course, God process the creation. And the other process is, uh, I forgot the term for it, but which goes through development, you know. But anyway, it, it, first the original, the original humans were had, had, uh, Adam and Eve. So, and then they had a baby, and that baby had to go through the uh, process of uh, the opposite of creation. And then, uh, of course, 
the fish, the first parent of the fish, they were also created, and they have children, and then the children has to go through the process of development. And uh, uh, the, the other one, the animal, the same thing, the parents, first parents of the animal, whatever animal they were, uh, they were the original, and then they have uh, babies, and those babies have to go through the process of, uh, could you please find the uh, opposite of creation, because I, the term it has escaped my mind. <laughs> opposite of creation, you know, the Darwin, uh, you know, the Darwin theory, evolution, I'm sorry. The process of, the process, so the process of evolution was contrary to what God said. Of course, the process of evolution uh, process of development step by step, which Darwin even said takes thousands of years. Uh, it didn't take that long, of course. The baby only uh, takes about nine months development in the tum tummy of a mother, and then after that, the baby is born and goes through the process of growing till maybe the age of 70 or 100 or whatever. So that is the, the process. But the originals of all the creatures in this world did not go through that process. They were the first parents of every species that God made. Because as God pronounced, they, uh, they existed. He's a God, you know, he, he does not have to go through whatever he says would happen. Uh, otherwise, he's not a God if he's not able to do that. Now, but what happens in our, the condition of the world nowadays? Everything was perfect before, but how come nowadays, if you look at the earth, there's shaking calamities, there's so much fear of uh, things that are happening, and uh, too much moral degeneracy, decline of spirituality, and uh, uh, people nowadays, uh, majority of the people in this world are lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, ungrateful, and loving, uh, brutal, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, holding the form of religion but denying its power, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What happened? Remember, uh, God gave a parable of the farmer who planted good seeds, and then when they went to sleep, the farm day there were weeds together with the good seeds. So disciples asked, where did the where did the disciples ask, where did those bad seeds come from? Well, when there were weeds, we only planted good seeds. And the master said, it was our enemy who when we were sleeping, he planted those weeds. So this is what happened. Because this earth, when Adam and Eve were tempted, were uh, convinced by Satan to obey him. Uh, in accordance to, uh, to obey him, which was uh, disobedient to what God said of do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, automatically this whole world became the dominion of Satan. And Satan has planted, the enemy of God has planted all these bad seeds. That's why although these things did not exist in the very beginning, because everything was perfect, when, when Satan uh, again, cum dominion. He was now the emperor of this earth. All of these things started to happen. Things go wrong, went wrong. Okay, uh, that's why, as I mentioned, explained it in, as I illustrated it before. If you have a, a brand new photocopy machine, brand new, and everything works perfectly, whatever you copy that, it looks almost exactly the same as the original. A copy. But if something goes wrong with the machine, then some of them will uh, will not be developed fully, only half developed, which could be, uh, we can compare to the children that are born that die as babies. Some of them will be uh, maybe copied only in the middle, maybe those who die in the middle of their uh, lifetime. And some of them who are blurred, maybe some sick, or some of them comes out with nothing at all. Maybe uh, they, they don't even exist at birth. So all things are uh, wrong, all wrong, so many wrong things happen. So 
when uh, when it was a perfect machine, everything was fine. But when it became imperfect, the things became wrong. So this is like what God did in the beginning was perfect. And when Satan gained dominion over the earth, things that came out of this earth, he planted so many things that were uh, in that made many things that God did imperfect. The leaves that is supposed to or uh, be green, it started to decay. The trees were supposed to live forever, started to die. Everything has to die. So anyway, so when God created the world, it was perfect world, that the footprints of God. But what happened? How did it become? The Bible said, like it said, an enemy have done this, and the enemy is Satan. The enemy is the devil. The Bible traces all the evil in this world to the malignant superhuman personality called the devil or Satan, who was originally created a perfect angel but fell to an inside position and now lives in a state of hardened religion or uh, rebellion against God. That's why so many wrong things happen, earth-shaking calamities, more degeneracy, and all this bad. Uh, behaviors and characters of people and that's why so many people are dying so many sicknesses come and the enemy has planted this okay um, now we know the history of Satan as I have uh, let me just review a little bit for those of you who have not heard if you would like to uh, see more or hear more of this how how the devil created because many many people say that oh if God did not want us to commit sin, how come he created the devil? God did not create a devil at all. He created a perfect being. He created Lucifer, who was a perfect angel. But Lucifer uh, made himself a devil. He was created perfect, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15. But he, he developed, because God gave Lucifer a uh, freedom of choice also. He can remain faithful to the Lord or remain perfect but he could make himself imperfect, see? He could cause a decay for himself. And some of the decay that he did, he made uh, his heart lift up, he became proud, he coveted the throne of God, he said, I should be worshipped instead of God, he lied about God, and so on, he invaded, and then uh, when he was thrown out of heaven, he invaded this world and usurped man's kingdom, became the emperor of this earth, uh, took the earth by aggression, he said, this is now mine, and he found a victory over evil, and so on. Now, when Satan claimed, of, claimed this earth, stole it from God, God has, cannot stop him, has to allow it, because he was able to, to tempt man. Man succumbed to his power with the temptation. That's why the whole earth, according to Psalm 51.5, all those that were born from Adam and Eve uh, were conceived in sin. So we are all considered sinners. See? When a mango bears fruit, it has to be a mango. It doesn't bear fruit to an apple. So uh, Adam and Eve were sinners. They can bear fruit children to righteous, automatically righteous people. They have to be sinners all the way down. That's why the whole generation of the earth were doomed. And if you read Revelation 13.8, uh, it says here that all that dwell on the earth worship the devil. All that were in the earth worship Satan. There, oh, and all that dwell on the earth worship the devil, and their names are not written in the book of life from the beginning of this world, right from the beginning. <laughs> but because of God's love, we know, I'm repeating it again, because of God's love, God sent his only begotten son here to that's all that whoever accepts him and believe in him, okay, because the the wages of sin is death. We are all doomed to eternal death because we were all worshiping the devil. So when God sent his only begotten Jesus, and we accept Jesus and we worship God, we worship Jesus, God through Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ himself, because he's also God, son of God. If we worship if we change our worship instead of the devil, worship Jesus as a God, as our Savior, then instead of eternal death, we will have eternal life. And that's what we're going to study later on, how 
we have uh, how God can save us. So the perfect uh, sinless angel, that's how he became a Satan, by turning against God. See? So Lucifer committed the, the throne of God, he lied about God, and when there was a war in heaven, he was thrown out of heaven, and he came to this earth to tempt uh, Adam and Eve, and automatically this earth became his dominion. He set up his kingdom here, and became the emperor of this earth, all the dwell of the earth worship and obey Satan. Revelation 13, 8, all the people of the earth were doomed to die, and their names are not written in the book of life. But if we accept Jesus, our names will, will be transferred to the book of life, because they are now in the book of death, or the worship Satan. So we're going to study this afternoon how our names could be transferred from the book of death to the book of life. Now, why does Jesus not intervene in what Satan is doing here? I'll give you an illustration. We are a democratic country. The United States is a democratic country. And the president of the United States is Biden right now. Now, China or Russia has a different kingdom, okay? Like uh, China, for example, kingdom and the uh, president there is, uh, is it uh, P, uh, Lee or P? I, uh, I, I didn't really uh, know that, but okay, let's say, let's use uh, Russia, okay? Putin, okay? Now, if Putin wants to kill all the babies in, the, in his uh, country there, if we are to execute people who are innocent, if he want to do whatever he want to do, if, if in case he want to do all kinds of bad things that I have shown you earlier, why does Biden, let's say that Biden is more powerful than Putin, U.S. is more powerful than Russia, so why does U.S. allow him to do it? Why, does, why do they not stop him from doing it? Because that's a different government, say. But if an American who is a subject of, of uh, Biden, a subject of the United States, is being persecuted in Russia, then America, Biden, tries try to do something to save that America. He tells Putin, I don't want you to touch that person, okay? Send him back here or, you know, it might even cause a war if, he's, uh, if he becomes really unreasonable to some of the subjects of the Americans, okay? That's why God allows Satan to do whatever he wants to do here on this earth because it's a different government. But sometimes God intervenes. Sometimes God intervenes with people. Not all the time. Sometimes if there's something good that could happen, sometimes he allows uh, the devil to do something to uh, make his people suffer because it, something good will come out of it, like what happened to Job, he allows it, okay? But Job is promised, is uh, promised a, a place in heaven, somehow by God. So sometimes allowed, but sometimes God intervenes, that's why some people sometimes are at the point of death and God makes them live because he has some plan for them to be accomplished in the earth. So that's how two different governments, government of Satan now on the earth, Although God created all this earth, he allows him, he allows sin to grow, but in the end, he is going to intervene to save his people. Anyway, we know that story already. Because of sin disobedience, they have to die. And of course, I just mentioned that. And that uh, we were redeemed by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he redeemed those people who accept him from eternal death. We were redeemed from eternal death. But he, Jesus did not promise to save everybody. He only promised to save those people who will receive and accept him and will receive his teaching and who will obey him. Okay? There are conditions, like if you listen to my sermon last week, if you not, you listen to it again, there are terms and conditions on how we could be saved. Just like anything else, like there are terms and conditions on how the Canadian government keeps us free, okay? 
certain conditions, we have to obey the laws, otherwise they will catch us and put us to jail. Okay? If we do so, if we do not go along with the terms condition, United States, all the countries in the world, they have their own terms and conditions. And Jesus has terms and conditions also for those people that he will save. Now, here I would like to show you now uh, the ways on how Jesus can save us. Jesus said, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, once wrote, I am a creature of a day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe in the happy show. God has written it down in a book for the Bible. The way to heaven was written by God in this book. Oh, give me that book. That's what John Wesley said. This is the heart cry of millions of men and women today, including ourselves. We are all hungry for simple understanding or understandable teaching that the way of, about the way of salvation. What is God's answer? When we started why Jesus came to this world, we found that God's way of salvation is through a person. That person is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way. But how does God's way operate? How does Jesus save? How does his saving work benefit us personally? This lesson is designed to answer this question. How does Jesus save? Now, you say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. On how. Jesus says, this is my instruction book. The Bible on how to find me. It was this book, the Bible, together with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that has changed the life of many people who are uh, really uh, big sinners. Like one of them, for example, is Tukichi Isi. Tukichi Isi was considered one, if not the most notorious convicted prisoner of Japan in the Japanese history. But through this book, by studying this book, which uh, contains God's instruction on how to be saved, it has changed his life. And he became uh, uh, what you call a vehicle of God to tell people about God's saving grace. So the first work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. John 16, 8. To, uh, yeah, now, when this work of conviction has made us, then there are three miracles of saving grace that every sinner needs to fit into heaven. So, there are three things on how God can save us. One is cleansing from the guilt of the past sin. We have to accept first that we are guilty. Number two, we have to have the power. God gives us power to overcome sin and to keep God's commandments. And number three, we have to be rescued from a world of disease, decay, and death. If these three needs could be met, we would have a complete salvation. All the ruin wrought by Satan would be repaired, and man would be restored to the position from which Adam fell. Can Jesus meet these three needs? Let me open the Bible and see. Okay? So the first thing is that we have to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Admit that you are guilty. Admit that you are a sinner. Because if you cannot admit that you are a sinner, there's no reason for repentance. There's no reason to come to Christ if you know that you are already perfect. All have sinned. According to the Bible, you cannot say that I am perfect now. All have sinned. There should be a change in our heart. I've talked to people who are doing many things that are wrong according to what God has instructed. They are doing the opposite. Okay? But they feel that they are doing the right thing already. They feel they are already righteous. So uh, Jesus cannot help them. Jesus cannot save them. Because although they are sinner, and our sin is transgression or disobedience to God's word or to God's law, although they are disobeying God's law already, but when you tell them they believe that they are obeying God, although they are not. And you compare to the Bible, they are disobeying God. 
but then they they believe that they are already righteous. So God cannot do anything to save them because they, they, they are not convicted to be wrong. See? So the first thing, the first miracle that Christ will do is justification. It's called justification. We first have to be justified by our faith. Romans 5.1. To be justified means to be put right with God, to be cleared of blame, to have one's innocence restored, to be accepted in God's sight, just as if we had never sinned. This means complete release from guilt and restoration of, to peace and fellowship with God. Romans 5.8, Christ died for us. 1 John 1.9, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. First, uh, Isaiah 1.18, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. To be in Christ means to be covered with his robe of righteousness. We have to be forgiven. It means the begging of a new God-governed life, just as Noah and his family were saved when they were in the ark. We have to make a step to go with Jesus, to accept Jesus. And the Hebrews man, Slayer, was saved when he was in the city of refuge. We have to find refuge in Jesus, the first thing. So we are saved from the condemnation of God's broken law when we are in Christ, Romans 8, 1. No condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, Colossians 2, 13. Having forgiven you all your trespasses, the release from the burden of guilt is unspeakably precious, but deep in our hearts, we know that something more then forgiveness is needed. The past has been cared for, but what about the present and the future? We need power to overcome sinful cravings and sinful habits to keep God's holy commandment. The gospel would be a tragic failure if it provided only forgiveness for the past and left as helpless victims of indwelling sin. What we need is a second mighty miracle of grace to set us free from sin's enslaving power. So the first step is to be justified in Christ. First step, if we have a desire to be saved by Christ and give eternal life, we have to accept Christ. Accept Christ. We have to, to accept that we are guilty. We have to accept that we, are, we have done many wrong things and feel sorry about it and allow Christ to change our life. So give ourselves to Christ so that Christ can do something to mold us to become a better person. So by accepting Christ, we are saved from eternal death. So that's the first step. We are justified uh, by grace, uh, by the love of Christ. From We are justified. That's why we are saved from eternal death. That is the very first step. Okay? Now, do we keep the law or what? We have to keep our law, God's law and wash our robes. Now, the second step. The second step is sanctification. Sanctification means, okay, here. First Thessalonians 5, 23. Sanctified holy. It should be preserved blameless. Sanctification means separation from unto God. Separation from sin, being a sinful nature, to become a godly in nature, setting apart for a holy use. Holiness has this meaning, for it is translated form the same word in the original Greek. Sanctification is the progressive breaking of sin's dominion, dominion in, con, in the consenting living life. It is the writing of God's law in the heart and the restoration of the lost image of God in man. Romans 6.14, sin shall not have dominion over you. John 8.36, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Hebrews 8.10, I will write my law in your hearts. 2 Corinthians 7.1, cleanse from all unbilkenness of the flesh and spirit, cleanse. The divine goal is sanctification, is the transformation of our character unto the likeness of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.18, changed into the same image. The divine agent in sanctification is the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 
27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my stature. But supposing the gospel made all this marvelous provision for forgiveness and victory and left us still in the, as victims of disease and death, Christianity would be like a bridge broken at one end. Obviously, a third miracle of grace is needed to rescue, rescue us permanently from our sin, cursed environment, and to put us forever beyond the reach of death. So, I'll give you an example just to illustrate this much better. Oh, Matthew, simpler. When Nicodemus accepted Jesus Christ, Nicodemus was saved from the curse of eternal death. So he was saved, he was forgiven from the curse of eternal death. But his worry now was, how do I achieve eternal life? How do I enter heaven? So if you go to the Bible, Nicodemus went to Jesus in the evening and asked Jesus, how do I enter the kingdom of God? How do I enter the kingdom of God, he said. Or how do I enter heaven? And Jesus said, if you would like to enter heaven, if you would like to have eternal life, you have to be born again. But Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? I'm already a big adult. Should I have to go back to my mother's womb to be born again? Jesus said to him, you are in your old life worshiping the devil because everybody worships the devil if you are a sinner. You have to die from that old life you have to die, you have to be buried in water and in spirit. So the water will be a symbol of the dirt. You have to be buried and you have to come out as a new person, a new life. Where you will not be serving Satan anymore, but you will be serving God. You will not be serving sin, but you will be serving righteousness. See? That's what I mean. Now in your old life, you are doomed to die. You know why you're doomed to die? Because in your old life, this is what, what kind of person you are, okay? According to the First Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, in our old life, many of us, okay, etc. Know you not that God made a provision? Though if you are in the old life of sinful life, God will not let you inherit the kingdom of God. He said here, Second, First Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. The fornicator, in your old life, you were probably a fornicator. In your old life, you were probably an adulter, an idolater. You probably worship and kneel down to idols. You're probably an adulterer also, you know. You're probably an uh, abuser of yourself with mankind. You're probably a thief. You probably steal from people. You're probably a covetous person. You get jealous with what other people have which you don't have. You're probably a drunkard. You probably do not respect your body. You might be a smoker. You're a divider. You're an extortioner. Okay? So in your old life, you can never enter the kingdom of God. You're probably uh, not obeying my Seventh day, Saturday, Sabbath, as a holy day. You're probably uh, worshiping on a different day, which I did not command, which is not according to my mark of authority. You're probably obeying an authority of a person, authority of somebody else, not my authority. So that was in your own life. See? Like uh, it also, you can find that, and according to God, if you are in the kind of life, according here, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 10, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. So you're doomed, okay? If you're in your old life. So also in Revelation 21, 8, it's also said here, the fearful, the unbelieving, you are probably an unbeliever, okay? In your old life. But now you would like to change, you are now a believer. Maybe you don't believe the Bible. So that's an old life. So you're probably fearful. You're probably afraid that your friends might uh, reject you if you accept me. You're afraid that Satan might curse you. Uh, if you respect, uh, if you accept me, your family might hate you. So you're a fearful person. You're probably a murderer. You're probably a whoremonger. You're probably a sorcerer. 
you are an idolater, a liar, you have, you know, then because of that, I can never give you eternal life. I will bring you to the lake, according to Revelation 21.8. I will bring you to uh, the lake of fire, which burned uh, in fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So I'll give you two deaths, because that's your own life. So if you want to enter heaven and achieve eternal life, you will have to die from that old life. Die in water. You'll be baptized in water. You'll be buried in the water. And you come out anew. That's why the baptism that God uh, taught was to be baptized. We immersed in water, which is a symbol of death from the old life. And coming out of the water to a new life. See? That's the symbol. So if you have not been baptized that way, you've never been baptized yet according to the Bible. You know, because there are many baptisms that many people are into those, which is not according to what is taught in the Bible. So if you are in that kind of life, I cannot save you because you are serving sin. Now, after being buried and come out to a new life, then you now come out a new life and, and you have to allow God to sanctify you. To transform you according to 2 Corinthians 3.18. I have to change you in my image. Transform you into the character in the likeness of me. In the likeness of Christ. Okay. Now that's a transformation. It's not going to be instant. It's not that after baptized you'll be changed right away. For example, it, it needs growth. Like if you are, uh, if out of every 10 stories that you give, 10 of them are lies they are not true at all, then maybe after being baptized, you're starting to grow in Christ. So maybe out of ten, nine are still a lie and one is already the truth. And as you improve, maybe two are truth and eight are still a lie. Or maybe five are still lies and five are already truth. You're improving. That's why we should never judge anybody because if you meet that guy and he tells you a story and it's one of the five that are already true, then you say that guy, that guy has changed. But if you happen to meet him and he's still in that, striving in that five which are still a lie, then you will judge him now. Oh, that guy is a liar. He never changed. You cannot judge people because he might be, God is already changing him, but he has not fully been transformed yet. See? So that's why Nicodemus said, if, according to Jesus, if you would like to enter the kingdom of heaven to have eternal life, you have to be born again. So we have to be born again. So that is the third, the second miracle, which is to be sanctified, to be buried in your old life, and to, uh, which you are serving Satan, you are serving sin, to a new life where you are serving righteousness, you are serving the truth. So in the new life, you now have to review God's commandments and you have to start obeying them what are the God's commandments do not have any other God before me number two do not make any graven image do not bow down to any idol any images do not serve it uh, and do not kneel to it do not pray to it or any human being okay do not pray to the dead people do not pray to the dead saints they cannot forgive you okay and that's a glory the third commandment is do not uh, call the name of God in vain. Do, do not swear. Okay? The fourth commandment is remember that the seventh day Saturday Sabbath is the holy day of God. Not Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. It's the Saturday. So if you're not obeying Saturday, you have to study about it and find out if it is really uh, has been changed because you'll never see it change if you are obeying the Bible. If you're not obeying the Bible, then it's up to you. You have the freedom to obey whatever you want, whoever you want. But according to the Bible, the uh, authority, the mark of God's authority is the seven-day Saturday Sabbath. So if you're working on a different day, you have to study, review your Bible, and accept it. If you don't want to accept it, continue worshiping the day that God did not sanctify or did not make holy. And you have to take the risk, you know. Uh, there's more risk doing that. They disobey God, it's okay. You know, God's not going to stop you, you know. He will allow you to do it. He allowed Satan to do whatever he wants because we have a free will, see? 
but you know, the end will justify the means, you know, so if you do not make it to heaven and do not achieve eternal life, then you have to just talk to yourself. I had an opportunity, but I did not listen to what the Bible says, okay? And number six, do not uh, uh, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long. Number seven, do not kill, uh, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, number nine, and uh, number 10, do not prevent. So you have to review them, and you got to change your life. You have to seek to be able to obey those things because uh, God is not going to allow you to take to heaven and dis continue disobeying him. So if you are used to disobeying him here, you will not be happy in heaven because those things will, will be obeyed by people who will be saved in heaven, see? So it's up to you. You can make a choice. And if you only want to stay here, you have a, have a choice also. No one's going to stop you. And God will probably bless you because he's on your life. And God wants people to be happy. So even if you don't obey God, you could be happy. If you work hard, you could become very rich and very uh, happy here, enjoy life. But, you know, but then enjoy all the happiness because this is the only life you might have. But if you want eternal life, then you have to obey God. Anyway, the third step is when with Jesus. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of Jesus that we may be glorified together. Glorification is the miraculous and complete change from mortality to immortality. When Jesus changes us, when we die and God resurrects us, we will never die again. Uh, we will only die one time if you are with God. But if you are, if you never change and you never accepted God's uh, God's instruction on how to be saved, how to have everlasting life, you have the risk of dying two times. Because if you read Revelation 20 verse 5, uh, it says here, Revelation 20 verse 5, it says here, but the rest of the dead live not for another thousand years. Because when Jesus resurrects, if we die now, you resurrect us to take the people to heaven. The, those are the same. And he said, the rest of the, uh, he said, but the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years. So those who uh, died without accepting these teachings of God on how to be saved, they will die. And when Jesus uh, resurrect the dead people who died obeying him, he will take them to heaven. But those who God did not resurrect, they would be dead for another thousand years. And then after this that God is resurrecting them to burn them together with Satan. Number six, blessed are the holy is that are those who have part in the first resurrection on such the second death will have no more power over them. See? Okay, and when the thousand years is expired, Satan will know it's out of prison. So, the thousand years that uh, they will still remain there until Jesus will resurrect them to burn them together with Satan. But that's what the Bible says, that's not what I'm saying. So, glorification is the when God changes you, uh, and when Jesus comes, if you happen to be alive, even if you're alive, you don't have to die, he will immediately, instantly change you to become an immortal person. You will not die anymore. That takes place in your bodies when Jesus comes again. First Corinthians 15, 51, 52, change in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal must be put on immortality. First Corinthians 15, 53. Philippians 3, 20, 21, our mortal bodies will be changed. Revelation 2, 7, 22, 14, restored in the tree of life. When the last great renovation of our physical bodies takes place at the second advent, we will be fully restored to the position from which Adam fell. In body, mind, and character, we will reflect the image of our Creator. We will be delivered forever from our sin-cursed environment and will be restored to face-to-face -to -face communion with God. Our salvation will be gloriously complete. So in that, man is absolutely unconscious with no activity or knowledge of any kind. But when God resurrects you and gives you 
and change your body to immortality, you will not die anymore. Okay? So we will experience God's love at the time uh, when Jesus comes, even for those who die. When we are sick and, the, and call the doctor, there are three steps towards recovery. Diagnosis, prescription, and application. Each step is indispensable. In this lesson, we have learned God's diagnosis of our sickness. Sin, we have discovered its remedy for sin. The saving power of Jesus Christ, which is justification and the uh, transformation of our life, which is sanctification, and third step, the application, giving us eternal life. We must dare to read our own names in the promises of God. We must take the gospel of medicine for ourselves. Psalms 116, 13. I will take the cup of uh, salvation. Okay, the Bible teaches us that we must have growth in grace just as there is continual growth in progression in normal, healthy, thriving plants. So there will be continual advancement towards maturity and the newborn, healthy Christian life. As I mentioned, there will be improvement in our life. Change, it might not be instantly, even gradual as we grow in Christ. The initial experience of conversion, forgiveness, and justification are not presented in the Bible as ends to in themselves, but as a mean to an end, namely the development, the development of a Christ-like character and the restoration of the lost image of God in the believing soul. However, this lesson is not intended to give the impression that the Christian life can be divided up into sealed of compartments or segments that have no connection with such with each other. The Christian life, like other forms of God-given life, is continuity, an organic unity with the with as a beginning and an end. God is the author of every part, every part of 100 percent gift and every part of 100 percent miracle. It is like Jesus' description of a living growing plant. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The ongoing work of the Holy Spirit is in sanctification. The progressive inward transformation of the character has been described as the work of a lifetime, and this element of continuity and sanctification is shown by the arrows on the chart. Okay, but it's also true that justification must be experienced on a continuous basis through neglect. The personal of realization and validity of justification can be lost. While one act of believing puts us in Christ, we do not say we don't stay in Christ automatically, nor we are held in Christ arbitrarily against our will. It is imperative to note that the benefits of justification do not cease with our initial act of believing. They are indeed, and they continue only as we keep on believing throughout our entire Christian experience. Thus, while the holy salvation process is underwritten by Christ's redemption act on the cross, its benefits continue to avail for us only as we continue to abide in Christ. Hence, the series of arrow following justification. The vital element of perseverance of sustained continuity in the Christian life is shown unmistakably in the New Testament by a consistent use of present continuous term tense in the original Greek, which describes the moment by moment relationship and the Christian believer to the Lord, which calls the passages coming, hearing, believing, taking, receiving, walking, continuing, I by abiding in and enduring. Uh, they are all used in the present continuous tense, the tense that denotes keeping on, sustained continuous habitual action to fit the absolute necessity of Christian perseverance if we are to be saved. Nowhere does the New Testament teach that we are automatically and irresistibly locked into a salvation by one initial act of believing. Our continued acceptance, assurance, Peace and fruitfulness depends not upon our initial reception, but upon our sustained retention of God's free gift. So we have to keep the law of God, and Jesus will wash our clothes. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will go to the Father but through me. My friends, if you are 
blessed and enlightened with the message of God to us today. I encourage you to please uh, visit my YouTube and subscribe so that it will reach many more people. Not for the by, by the way, there are many hackers and uh, many people who are doing uh, bad things uh, in the internet. So if you receive any information that I'm asking for money, I'm asking for donation, even one cent, I'm not asking anybody for any amount of money, not even a cent. Okay, we're doing our ministry by allowing God to just supply us with a means to be able to spread this wonderful uh, words of salvation to those who are lost. Uh, we are financing our own ministry. We're not asking money from anybody, by the way. So there are many scammers out there, uh, many hackers. If you send a, a message saying that Dr. Noel Frias or God's Word Not to Everlasting Life is asking for donation or asking for uh, uh, what they call it, gift cards to help people or so on. Do not believe that. Okay? You call me. My number is there. 416-875-5841 and verify or you should report that person to the proper authorities because I am not authorizing anybody to ask for money from anybody. Okay? So remember that. But I invite you to click subscribe so that this will reach more people. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Remember that the only way to the truth, to life, to eternal life is Jesus Christ. I would like to invite you now to bow your heads uh, with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this hour that you have given us in order to enlighten people about your three ways on how you're able to save uh, people in this world and how to give them eternal life. The Father, I pray that those who have listened will take the note of this and they will obey you and they'll come to you because you're the only way to everlasting life. And those who have not heard this message, may these people who have heard them, share them to their friends and relatives to as many people as possible and those who have not heard them, please guide them to be able to come across these messages in the Facebook as well as in YouTube. And that they will be drawn uh, towards the foot of the cross to you and to be a part of your come. So that when you come in the clouds of heaven, there will be among those people whom you'll save in turn them in your turn kingdom and be able to receive everlasting life as you have promised. Forgive us from all we have fallen children in glory and please give us the blessings that you have in store for us today. I ask all this favor in Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. So my friends, uh, thank you so much for being with us today and we'll see you again next time that God has a message uh, for you. Thank you. Bye-bye.